Thanks for listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. You guys are the all-singing, all-dancing crap of the world. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Wow. Here we are. Yeah, it's kind of been face a while. Face to face. Yeah, it's, I guess we're back, though. That's that's good, isn't it? Sorry, I wasn't able to sell that line very well. <laughs> um, all right, let me think. Uh, there's a new girl at work. She's really pretty. Let me focus on that. Hey, we're we're back, guys. Oh, I still can't do it. Yeah, that's unfortunately that's how you sound when you talk to pretty girls. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> you might want to focus on something else. A little. There's something, usually a lot more stammering involved. Yeah, guys. something that makes you stammer and worry and sweat a little less. Yeah. <laughs> we're thirty seconds into the podcast, and the th- the flop sweat is just whoo. It's like Patton Oswalt on his honeymoon here, guys. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we are. Back with a brand new edition. Big, will it ever stop? I don't know. Hmm. Uh, we we have a story today. Oh, oh yes. And um, we probably should just get that out of the way. Play the story, so because I, I assume there are people here for the story, not for us. Yeah, I think that's what most of them are here for. That's why that gives my goats numbers are so low compared to the show. Yeah. <sighs> you really should listen to that gets my goat, folks, because. Uh, a, it happens way more often. That's where my heart's at. And B, it's much easier. <laughs> so today's episode is called Hope on the Rocks. And I believe it's by A.W. Gifford. A.W. I love that place. They have those root beer floats that are so tasty. Oh, let's stop recording and go there. Yeah, yeah. Let's we do really, that instead. We don't really need an episode, right? There are so many times when we've gotten together to podcast. And something like that happens. Like, do we need to do an episode? It's like we both went and saw that movie, but maybe it's enough that we saw it. (laughs) All right. So the episode is written by A.W. Gifford. About the author. A.W. Gifford is an internationally unknown author who is an editor at Bet Noir magazine and Dark Opus Press. His work has appeared in numerous magazines, anthologies, and he was once spotted stalking the woods of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, on our show, he did In the Gloaming. And uh, we won't make a Gloamer joke this time. And uh, is there any other preamble? It was produced by Richard uh, uh, Outfield. So that guy doesn't need to be mentioned. No, let's just play the story. And uh, those that are getting off on this floor... Uh, can exit the elevator. (laughs) All right. See you on the flip side. Bye. Hope on the Rocks by A.W. Gifford. Every life's a three-minute story, the bartender said, holding up the glass he'd been drying, as if expecting it to be cleaner than the towel he used. I put on my best, leave-me-alone face. Getting into a conversation wasn't on the schedule, especially not a conversation with a bartender. I'd seen enough television to know that some bartenders acted like shrinks, tried to convince you that there were people worse off. But how could anyone have it worse than me? Fired from my last job for chatting with my friends online while on the clock, I had little money and bills up to my ass. I'd been looking for work for the past several months, but architectural jobs just weren't as abundant as they used to be, especially with the economy in the toilet. I even began to write a little again. I figured that while I looked for real work, I could once again chase the dream of writing, but nothing was panning out with that either. And to top it all off, just a few days ago, my wife filed for divorce. No, I don't think anyone could have it worse than me. All I wanted was to slip into a bar, grab a good stiff drink, go home, and kill myself. In fact, I almost didn't make it to the bar at all. The interview at the architectural firm of Johnson, Bradley, and Smith had gone so poorly, I'd thought about jumping through their 16th floor lobby window and splattering myself all over the street below. 
just skip the bar, the drink, and home altogether. That may not have saved me a whole lot of trouble, but it would have at least saved me from having to talk to this pudgy bartender. Excuse me, I asked. Every life's a three-minute story, the bartender repeated. After placing the glass he'd been drawing atop a stack of glasses that I assumed were clean, he picked up another. Perhaps having a scotch wasn't such a good idea after all. There was a moment of silence as I waited for the bartender to continue, but he didn't. I sat on a stool with my elbows propped on the bar, swirling the scotch around the glass. I sipped my drink, grateful that he didn't say anything else. But he didn't move away. He kept drying the glass and staring at me. Ignoring the fact that I didn't respond, the bartender continued. It's just been my experience. He finished with the second glass and placed it on top of the first. He went to pick up another glass, then stopped. You see, I hear a lot of stories. People think it's part of my job to listen to them, but it ain't. I'm just supposed to pour them a drink and move on to the next guy. When they're finished, I collect the money. That's it. But you know what? I just looked at him without responding. Maybe he would get the hint. The bartender picked up another glass. I enjoy listening to the stories. It passes the time when it's slow, like now. I looked around. Besides myself, there were two other drinkers sitting in this gloomy bar. Both were sitting at the same table on the far side of the room. I turned back to the bartender. Since silence wasn't working with this man, I asked, Why do you say that every life is a three-minute story? Hear the music? Yeah. Country. So? I've been listening to country music for all of my life. And most of it, well, most of the older stuff anyhow, seems to deal with a life story. You ever hear that joke about what do you get if you play country music backwards? A tired joke. Who hasn't heard it? And I wasn't in the mood for a joke. Sighing, I answered his question anyway. Yeah, you get your wife back, your house back, your truck back, your dog back. That's the one. <laughs> the bartender laughed. <laughs> I shook my head. He had such a harsh laugh. So what does country music have to do with people's life stories? Over the years, I've noticed that most stories people tell me can be summed up in just about three minutes. Of course, they take much longer for the person to tell, but usually three minutes will do. I suppose you want me to tell you my life story. I didn't want to. I wasn't in the mood, but I started anyway. You want to know how a middle-aged bum in a rumpled suit and crooked tie came to be sitting at your bar? To be honest, I'm a little tired of that, the bartender said. What I would like is for someone to listen to my story for a change. I drained my scotch in a quick, tidy gulp. But as I put the glass down, the bartender started to pour another. I really need to be going, I said. Nonsense, the bartender said as he pushed the scotch toward me. This, he said, holding up a bottle with a blue label, is the good stuff. And this one's on me. Thanks, I said, knowing that by accepting this drink, I was obligating myself to listen. After this, I have to be going. Fair enough. But answer me this. Why are you in such a rush to get home? Are you that eager to kill yourself? I just looked at the man, stunned into silence. Had I told him my plans? I didn't think so. Uh, how... <laughs> the bartender laughed more of that harsh laugh. <laughs> so you are planning on killing yourself. As I opened my mouth to respond, I found I didn't know what to say. I've been doing this for a long time, the bartender said. I've gotten pretty good at spotting people like you. Many people come in here thinking they're going to find the courage to kill themselves at the bottom of a bottle. 
and I suppose some may leave here with that courage. But I like to think that letting them vent to me keeps them on this planet for a while longer. The bartender reached into the pocket of his apron. I thanked God it was black, but it looked just as dirty as the towel. He pulled out a red-dyed rabbit's foot on a brass chain and tossed it onto the bar in front of me. What's this? I asked. A rabbit's foot. I can see that. What's it for? It brings the bearer good luck. Now, I'd never believed in talismans, but I picked up the foot nonetheless and turned it over in my hand. The fur felt a bit odd. Not unlike rabbit's fur, but not quite like it either. Then something strange happened. The foot began to grow warm. Then a tingling sensation crawled up my arm. For the first time in several weeks, I felt calm, with no worries. I felt as if I could do anything I wanted, anything at all. The foot slipped out of my hand as I turned it over, and it fell back onto the bar with a small thump. All my troubles flooded back. I tried to snatch the foot back, but the bartender grabbed it before I could. Felt good, didn't it? What? What was that? I asked, still not believing what I felt. That was a rabbit's foot, the bartender said with a sly smile. I know it's a rabbit's foot, but I, I mean, what was that I felt? I mean... I've held a rabbit's foot before, but I've never felt anything like that. At the time, you didn't need the charm. What do you mean? A rabbit's foot works only if the bear really needs it to work. He put the foot back into his apron. You see, most people don't need a charm. That's why they don't feel anything. But those who have a need for one can feel the power within. I waited for him to continue, but he didn't. All he did was to wipe the bar and move away from me. Wait a minute, I said. You told me you wanted someone to listen to your story. He came back. Ah, yes, I almost forgot. I've owned this bar for, well, for more years than I'd like to admit. The first years, I really struggled. I had creditor problems, supplier problems, and finally, health department problems. I've had my dealings with the health department, I said. Not a fun bunch of people. What kind of work do you do? I took a sip of the scotch I nearly forgot about. I'm an architect. I've been unemployed for six months now. Sorry to hear. How's the scotch? Excellent. And it was. So anyway, back to the story. The health department was about to close me down. Something about an air intake too close to an exhaust vent. All I know is that it was giving me a hell of a lot of grief, you know what I mean? I nodded. It's not as if I had a booming business. I was just starting out, but I did want to give it my all. I really thought that I would have to shut down. I just didn't have the money to fix the problem. But then one day this man walked in here and started to tell me a fanciful tale of how he hid it rich in the stock market. He was wearing a fancy suit and he tells me that his luck finally changed when he was handed this foot. The bartender took the foot out of his pocket again and placed it on the bar. Though I struggled with the urge to pick it up, I resisted. Go ahead, take it, he said. Notice how good it makes you feel. He smiled as I took the foot. To make a long story short, the man gave me the foot. He said he could see that I needed it more than he did. Shortly after this man paid me a visit, things started to look up. The health department reevaluated the situation with the exhaust vent and came to the conclusion that it was indeed within code. My creditors gave me an extension, suppliers started to come through, and business picked up. I didn't hear much of what he said after I picked up the foot. My mind started to fill with all the possibilities of what I could do, and a great story was taking shape. 
The man told me the day would come when I would have to give the foot away and that I would know when that day came. Today is that day. I feel that I'm ready to give up the rabbit's foot and you, my friend, seem to be the perfect one to give it to. This last bit I did hear. Excuse me? I think you heard me. I did, but I couldn't have heard you right. You did. I'm going to give you the foot. I couldn't believe this. No one gives something this good away. What's the catch? I asked. You're a smart guy. Yes, there is a catch. You have to give me something. I don't have much money. That's not what I want. What is it then? If it's not money, what? I can give you anything. Anything? That's what I said. Would you give up your soul? At first I didn't know what to say. Was he serious? Did I hear him right? I wasn't sure. Did you say give up my soul? Sure did. To tell the truth, I didn't know. Not being a religious man, could I give up something I didn't really believe existed? I stayed silent for a while. The bartender couldn't know my lack of religion, so what would the harm be to give it up if it would give me the rabbit's foot? Sure, I said, and I gave the bartender a sly smile of my own. As long as I get the foot. One lucky rabbit's foot for one soul. He stuck out his hand, and I shook it. Turning the foot over in my hand, I said, Are you the devil? <laughs> he laughed. I had you going. I can't believe I did that with a straight face. No, I'm just a bartender. I can't take your soul. And why are you giving me this? I just am. A pay-it-forward kind of thing. So, how does it work? It's just lucky is all. You don't have to do anything. You know what I wish for? Wish all you want. The foot doesn't work that way. It just brings you luck. Just remember, as the man in the suit told me, one day you will have to give the foot away. You have to pay it forward. Oh, whatever. I really wasn't listening to him. As I turned the foot over and over in my hand, the story idea grew and kept growing until I had the best story idea I'd ever had. I'd been writing off and on since I was a kid. Some of the stories I wrote were cute. Some were pretty good, and some were downright awful. Once I was an adult, I would write a little from time to time. Then years would slip by without any significant writing at all. After my wife left, I delved into the worlds of my imagination again, since the real world proved to be too painful sit in front of my computer and try to start a story. And sometimes I'd start only to figure out a few thousand words in that it was no good. Now, with this rabbit's foot in hand, I had a great idea, and I wanted to get home right away to work on it. I really think this thing worked, I said to the bartender. Of course it did. I stood, and though I couldn't afford to, threw a twenty on the bar. Thanks, the bartender said as I started to leave. And don't be a stranger. Stepping out into a light drizzle, I left the bar in a state of euphoria I hadn't felt in a long time. I didn't care that it was raining. All I cared about was the rabbit's foot in my hand and the story in my head. When I entered my apartment 20 minutes later, I threw my keys on the kitchen counter and headed right for my computer. It seemed to take forever for it to boot up, all the while the story nearly bursting from my brain. I'm not a fast typist, and I could barely keep up with the story as it formed in my head. I arrived home just after four in the afternoon, and by 9.30, my stomach was telling me I should take the time to eat. My fingers, on the other hand, didn't want to stop. In the end, the loud rumblings of my hungry stomach won out. Fifteen minutes later... I was back with a ham sandwich in one hand and a glass of water in the other. Typing while I ate, I kept writing until I could no longer keep my eyes open. At three o'clock in the morning, I stopped 
for the night. I checked my progress and was shocked to see I had just shy of 160 double-spaced pages. I was exhausted, but I couldn't sleep. The realization that I was doing what I've always wanted to do was starting to sink in. I didn't know what to do next. 160 pages. I'd never written so much on one story in my life, let alone in one day. Exhaustion finally overtook me, and I had one of the best night sleeps I've had in many months. I awoke the next morning to the sound of birds outside my bedroom window and sunlight seeping through the gaps in the vertical blinds. 8.30 in the morning, and I felt completely refreshed. After making myself breakfast, I went back to my computer. Now, I suppose I should have been out looking for a job, since money was short, but the story begged to be told. I sat at the computer, turned it on, opened the story, and started typing, picking up where I left off, as if I'd never stopped. The phone rang at 3.30. I picked it up, though I was determined not to answer. But I did when I saw that it was Johnson, Bradley, and Smith on the caller ID. I was too curious to let this call go. Hello? Hi, Joel? Yes? This is Stephen Smith from Johnson, Bradley, and Smith. How are you this afternoon? Fine, I said, trying to think up a reason this man would be calling. Hey, listen, we had a great time interviewing you yesterday, and we would love it if you would come work for us. What do you say? I found myself dumbfounded by this statement. But you all laughed at me. Joel, no, no, (laughs) he said, laughing as if we were old friends. (laughs) I'm sorry if you thought that. We were all having a great time. You're a funny guy. That's why we want you to come work for us. I couldn't believe this. There was no way they were having a great time. I'd shown them some of the projects I'd done, and they laughed and said it looked childish. Was this a joke? The number on my caller ID was from their office, but why would they do this? However, I wasn't going to jinx this either. Well, I just got the impression you didn't like the work I showed you. No, no. We were all laughing at the problems you described. We've all had problems like those. We've just never seen the humor before you came around. There was a pause. What do you say? Sure. I hoped I didn't sound too surprised. When do you want me to start? How about Monday? Is Monday good for you? Sure. Monday's fine. Great. We'll see you then. After I hung up, I picked up the rabbit's foot sitting next to my computer. Was all this happening because of the foot? Poking the foot into the front pocket of my jeans, I continued typing. By quarter to eight in the evening, I had added another 140 pages. I'd just finished the first draft of a novel. After saving the manuscript, and then saving a backup to a flash drive, I printed out a hard copy. I put the manuscript aside and went out to celebrate. I'd never realized how lonely I was until I sat in a restaurant by myself. A thought came to me that only the drunk and the depressed drink by themselves. But I went out to celebrate, and I was going to have a drink. I went to Mickey's Bar and Grill, sat at the bar, and ordered a plate of buffalo wings and a beer. There was no need for scotch today. I was happy, not trying to drown my sorrows in alcohol. As I ate my celebratory dinner, I must have looked worse than I thought. The waitress, an attractive brunette, sat next to me. You look a bit lonely, she said, taking the stool next to mine. I suppose, I said. Mind a little company? Not at all, as long as you're not offended by my eating. I'm Maggie, she said. Well, actually, Margaret, but I really hate that name. I wiped my hands on a napkin. I'm Joel. Nice to meet you. We shook hands and sat in silence for a few moments. I think we were both a little nervous. I didn't come in here looking for a date. But I couldn't deny my attraction for this woman. She broke the silence between us. 
So what brings you in this evening? I'm celebrating, I said. Oh? What are you celebrating? A new job I start on Monday. And I just finished the first draft of a novel. A novel? She said, as if she didn't know the word. And a new job. What kind of work do you do? I'm an architect. A male voice called from across the room. Maggie, I need you back here. Sorry, that's my boss. That's all right. She stood up. Don't be a stranger, Joel. She said as she walked away, but before she passed through the door to the back room, she turned and smiled at me. The first day at job can cause anyone to be nervous, and I was no exception. When I stepped into the lobby, I must have looked lost, because it wasn't long before the receptionist spoke. Joel? I turned to her, but didn't say anything. She stood up and came around her desk. I'm Kathy, she said, with her hand outstretched. Today was going to be a day of a lot of handshaking and not much actual work. It's good to meet you. Likewise, I said. Mr. Smith would like to meet with you in his office first thing this morning, if you would follow me, she said, and started to walk away. I followed her. I still had it in my head that that call from Stephen Smith was a prank. I half expected security to throw me out, or for a group of people to be in Stephen Smith's office, ready to laugh one last time at my expense. But that didn't happen. Security wasn't called, and when I was shown into Stephen Smith's office, he was the only one in the room, sitting behind his immense steel and glass desk. Joel, he said, standing up. Good to see you again. Thanks. It's good to be here, Mr. Smith. Please, call me Steve. Everyone does. But I looked toward the office door. Steve laughed. <laughs> Kathy's an old-fashioned gal. I've asked her to call me Steve I don't know how many times. He motioned to a chair in front of his desk. Please have a seat. I did, and we chatted for about an hour. Then Steve took me around the office and introduced me to the other employees. Finally, he showed me to my own desk. Get situated and then see John. He'll give you something to work on and bring you up to speed on his project. We want you to get your feet wet before giving you a project of your own. Who? I asked. I'd been introduced to a lot of people in a short amount of time, and I couldn't remember a John. Steve pointed to a red-haired man sitting a few desks over. The man in turn looked at me and waved. I returned home after my first day at work, all jazzed up. The day went better than I could have hoped and all the people were friendly and helpful. Work had never been so much fun. I went back to Mickey's, hoping to see Maggie again. Once again, I sat at the bar and ordered wings and a beer. While nursing the beer, I waited for my wings and Maggie to appear. I scanned the room, but didn't see her. Maybe I misread her. Maybe she wasn't interested in me after all. I picked up my beer and took a quick drink as the bartender approached. This guy was clean, well-groomed and broad-shouldered, the exact opposite of the bartender that gave me the rabbit's foot. You're Joel, right? Yeah, uh, but how did you know? I was working in back last night and saw you and Maggie hit it off. She asked me to call her if you showed up today. Mondays are a day off. She just wanted me to tell you that she's on the way and for you to stay put. I smiled. Maggie was coming here on her day off to see me. Talk about being nervous. Ten years had passed since my last date, and the butterflies in my stomach felt like a flock of monarchs on their annual migration. She arrived fifteen minutes later, wearing the classic little black dress, her hair done up in soft curls. She looked as if she was planning this all day. I, on the other hand, looked as if I'd just been run over. I still wore my work clothes, but I had left the tie at home. My shirt was wrinkled, and I hadn't shaved before coming here. In hindsight, maybe I should have. I stood up to greet her. You look stunning. Her cheeks flushed at my comment, and she said, You don't look bad yourself. Don't kid yourself. 
If I'd known this was going to be a date, I would have cleaned up. It's not a date, she said. I just wanted to see you again. You left the other night before we had a chance to talk. Would you care to join me for dinner? I would love to. I tried to flag down the bartender to let him know to cancel my order, but Maggie insisted we have our dinner there. You're too well-dressed for a place like this, I said. Hey, I work here, you know. I didn't mean any offense. I just meant that you look as if I should take you to a restaurant that uses cloth napkins and has food that you don't eat with your fingers. I like eating food with my fingers. She lowered her voice. Besides, getting dirty can be a bit fun. I wasn't too sure what she meant by that, but being a man, my mind made plenty of it. We sat at a table in the back corner, away from the bulk of the crowd. We ordered more wings, fries, and plenty of beer. We didn't run out of things to talk about. There was never any of that awkward silence between us. And before we knew it, the bar was closing. I suppose we should be going, she said. I would offer you a ride home, I said. But I walked here. She looked a little surprised. Where we lived hadn't come up in our prior conversation. You don't live in the apartments around the corner, do you? I was a little embarrassed. The apartments were on the lower end, but at the time of my divorce, it was all I could afford. Maybe she saw my discomfort because, before I could answer, she said, Don't be embarrassed. I live there, too. Would you mind if I walked you home, then? I would love that. The night had cooled off but not enough to make a walk uncomfortable. We walked hand in hand back to the apartment complex, talking the whole way. After we passed the first two buildings, we stopped. This is my building, Maggie said. Then came the first awkward silence of the night. I wanted to kiss her goodnight, but I didn't want to seem too forward. I had a great time tonight, I said. Me too, she said. I've needed a night like this for a long time. I should be going, I said. But before I could say good night, Maggie stepped up and kissed me. Never in my life has a kiss tasted sweeter. Sorry, Maggie said as she pulled away. I shouldn't have done that. There's no need to apologize. And there wasn't. This had been one of the best days of my life. Maggie had to work the rest of the week, but we made a date to have breakfast Saturday morning before Maggie's shift. I could hardly wait. Just thinking about her made my heart pound and my palms sweat. After work the following day, I resisted the urge to go to Mickey's. Maggie was working, and I didn't want to be the reason she lost her job. I fixed myself dinner, then sat in my recliner with my manuscript and began to edit. As I read through the story... I found it really didn't need much in the way of editing. My red pen stayed capped for most of the evening. Was it really that good? Or was my biased perspective getting in the way? I decided to put it aside for a month before looking at it again. With nothing else to do, I began a second novel. This one didn't come as easy as the first, but it came nonetheless. By the time I'd stopped for the evening... I was more than halfway through the first draft. On Saturday, I awoke early, showered, shaved, and just as I was finished getting dressed, there was a knock at my door. I answered the door, and there she stood, wearing tight jeans and a red blouse. I did all I could do to resist taking her to my bedroom. Are you ready to go? Maggie asked. Just let me grab my keys. What is that? she asked, pointing to my keys. My keys? I mean, that red thing. Oh, this, I said, holding up the rabbit's foot. I didn't want to tell her the story of the bartender. I didn't know if telling anyone would jinx the charm. It's just something I've had since I was a kid, I lied. It's a bit disturbing, don't you think? I didn't know you were into animal rights. I'm not. It's... Oh, never mind. I'm hungry. Where would you like to go? There's a small cafe down the street. I can never remember the name, but they have good food. 
Sounds good. Our second date turned out to be better than the first. Though it started at the small cafe down the street, it ended back at my apartment, and Maggie ended up late for work. Three months later, Maggie and I were once again in my bed, but this time we were celebrating the sale of my novel to a major publishing house. Do you think you'll continue to work at JBS? She asked. I'd hate to leave, but this has always been my dream, I said. If writing for a living is your dream, then why don't you chase it? Maggie was right. I followed her advice and left JBS just shy of my first anniversary. But in hindsight, I should have waited to see how well my novel sold before quitting my job. An advance only lasts so long. I have a bad habit of twirling my keys and tossing them in the air while I walk. On my last day of work at JBS, I twirled and tossed my keys, maybe with a little more exuberance than normal. The brass of the red rabbit's foot gleamed in the late afternoon sun. I tossed them once more, but this time I missed the catch, and the keys, along with the rabbit's foot, went right down the storm sewer. It wasn't the keys I worried about. I had a spare set at home, but there was only the one rabbit's foot. I threw myself to the grate, looking down into the abyss, but I didn't see anything. The rabbit's foot was gone. I'm not sure how long I was lying on the asphalt before I heard someone behind me. What are you doing, Joel? I looked up. John Harmon was looking down at me. His red hair took on a burnt orange tint in the afternoon sun. Drop something? He asked. My keys. That sucks. He was trying to hold back his laughter, but was failing. <laughs> Do you have a spare set? Yeah, but... I looked back to the sewer. Would you like a ride home to get them? Thanks, but no, I said, standing up and brushing off. I'll call Maggie and have her bring them. All right. He stuck out his right hand. It's been nice working with you. Take care of yourself. I will. Using my cell phone, I called Maggie and asked if she could bring the extra set of keys. What was going to happen now that the foot was gone? Was the foot really my source of good luck. Maggie pulled up twenty minutes later and rolled down the window. Here you go, sweetie. She handed me the keys. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Are you sure? You look a bit pale. I'm fine. I leaned in and gave her a kiss. Thanks, babe. I'll see you at home. Love you. That was the last time I told her that while she was alive. On our way home, with me following behind, I watched in horror as a truck ran a red light and slammed into the driver's side of Maggie's Taurus. She never had a chance. The ring I planned on giving her that night at dinner was buried with her. After the funeral, I went home, sat on the couch, and cried. She died because of me, because of my carelessness. If I hadn't dropped the keys, Maggie would still be here. The phone rang. I wiped the tears from my eyes and took a few deep breaths, then decided I wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, so I let the machine answer. Joel? It was my editor. I'm so sorry to hear about Maggie. I hate to have to call, and I know this really isn't a good time. But I thought you should know. I've been replaced. I think you still have a chance of having your book come out this fall as planned, but... Ah, hell. You don't want to hear all this from the machine. I'll call back. The electronic beep of the machine let me know that the spark of my dreams had turned into cold, gray ashes. I stood, grabbed my keys, and left the apartment. I wasn't sure where I was headed, but I knew I couldn't just sit around. I had to get away. Rain fell in a light drizzle, 
but not enough to deter me from going for a walk. The grayness of the day matched my dreary mood. By the time I walked around the perimeter road of the apartment complex, I decided to go for a drive. My clothes were soaked through by that point, but I didn't care. I drove around for about an hour before making my way to the bar. I pulled into a parking stall right in front, turned off the engine, and got out. The rain was falling harder, but I just stood there, not believing my eyes. Though the time was just past five in the afternoon, the bar was alive and packed with patrons. I opened the door and was greeted by the cackle of a woman, as if the bar itself was mocking my misery. At first I thought I was in the wrong place, but behind the bar was the same pudgy bartender that gave me the rabbit's foot. He recognized me at once. Hey, how are you doing? He asked me when I stepped up to the bar. Scotch on the rocks, right? That's right, I said, a little surprised. I hadn't been to this bar since the day he'd given me the rabbit's foot. But I'm here to ask you a question. All right, but let me get you that drink first. I don't really have the time. Nonsense. He grabbed a glass and began to pour the amber liquid. Everyone has time for one drink. I, I don't have... I started to say I didn't have any money, but he stopped me mid-sentence. Drinks are free to the man who helped my business get back on its feet. He set the glass in front of me. Now, what is your question? I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> I need to know if there is another of those rabbit's feet. He didn't say anything at first. Then he slowly shook his head. I'm sorry, but that's all there was. You didn't lose it, did you? I accidentally dropped it down a sewer. He pushed back from the bar. I can't remember if I told you, but when your luck begins to sour, you have to give it away or else your luck will continue to decline. That's why I gave you the foot. My business would have failed if I hadn't. I wanted to reach across the bar and shake this man until he gave up another foot. But I didn't have the energy any longer. I was tired, both physically and emotionally. I left the drink untouched on the bar and headed back out into the rain. I returned to my apartment, a beaten and broken man. After tossing my keys on the end table next to the couch, I plopped down into my recliner. That was three days ago. In that time, no one has come to my door, and no one has called to see if I'm okay. It's as if the whole world forgot that I even exist. If that's true, then perhaps the whole world won't miss me when I'm gone. I thought it was just my luck coming around at last. I never really believed it was the rabbit's foot. That's why I just put it on my keychain. If I had known the effects of losing the damn thing, I would have put it in a safe deposit box. It's funny how your life can change. One minute you're in the gutter, the next you're on top of the world, only to be knocked back into the gutter the moment you reach the peak. I will now finish what I set out to do before I met that bartender. The noose is tight and I tested the strength of the ceiling fan. It seems strong. I just hope it holds long enough to get the job done. I've come full circle, and now it's time to close the loop.
And that's the end. Time to close the loop. And then the funeral. This is a really depressing story, actually. <laughs> it's good, but it's sad. Author's note. This story began life as a bit of overheard conversation. I can't remember where I was when I heard it, but it stuck with me. Now, the line isn't as strange as, say, if it weren't for my horse, I never would have spent that year in college. But for me, it was intriguing. The line I heard was, I don't know, but every life is a three-minute story. One, what don't they know? And two, how does that relate to every life being a three-minute story? I let that line turn over in my head for a few days. Then I slowly began to envision a man sitting at a bar telling the bartender his story. Doesn't sound very original, does it? Then I thought, what if I turned the tables and had the bartender tell his story instead? Throw in an homage to W. W. Jacobs, the monkey's paw, Viet the rabbit's foot, and Hope on the Rocks was born. I wrote the bar scene shortly after my divorce. Yes, there is some similarity between Joel and myself. And it went pretty quick. But then the story sat on my computer, languishing in the vast sea of forgotten ones and zeros for the better part of two years. Then I met my wife, Jennifer, and I got the idea for the character of Maggie. Jennifer now asks if I'm going to kill her off in any more of my stories. I hope you liked this story, and if you want to see more from me, check out my collection Dreams of Mad Children. Sorry. Coming this June from Ashmore Creek Press. Also, you may visit my website at www.awgifford.webs.com for news, free stories, and the sporadic blog post. Uh, uh, that's it. We're back. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, Big. Welcome back, Rish. Announcer man. What's wrong with him? Welcome back. That's right. Welcome back, Caroline Spurry. Does Caroline Spurry still listen to the show, Announcer Man? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody else, Announcer Man? Welcome, Rich Girardi. Is he even alive anymore, um, Announcer he Man? He is. It was his birthday just the other day. Okay. Well, that's good. Announcer Hilarious. Man, I appreciate you keeping us in the loop with things. How about that Dave Krummenacher? Uh, no, no, no more names, announcer man. I, <laughs> look, we, we don't have a lot of time. Welcome back, Abigail yeah, Hilton. It, no, I, I, I appreciate that you want to participate in the show, but <laughs> we, we've got to go. Big's missing dinner right now. That's it's, right. Uh, I don't know if it's on the table or in the microwave or it's more in likely in garbage the garbage can you know. now. But, Thanks to you. Welcome, Brian Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, Brian is a good guy, but... Welcome. Uh, announcer man, please, just... Oh, uh, mention the pipe thing to him. Uh, how long has it been since you smoked your pipe, announcer man? Your point is, don't all your friends smoke pipes? They do, actually, yes, all of them. <laughs> um, Gandalf and uh, Sherlock Holmes and, and you, announcer man. <laughs> Okay, I, thanks, man. We'll see you. We'll see you at the end of the show. All yeah, right. there's uh, some promos that need to be recorded over there. Somebody, I, I think I just saw the announcer man light go up in the sky. <laughs> there you go. Screw you guys. Whoa, I guess we uh, needled him a little too much. All right, so um, shoot, uh, what should we do on this? When back when we had a show, we would after the. Uh, After the story, story we'd do the feedback, right? You and, and Anne Leckie would do that. <laughs> but we'd also have, we did the author's note, but we'd also have a voice cast kind of thing. Cast of characters. We had a name for uh, that. Yeah, I think it was called the cast list. Cast list. So, uh, do you want to go down the cast list very briefly and then we'll... Okay, the cast list today involves Big Anklevich as the bartender. Okay. Gino Moretto... Hey, none of that. Uh, <laughs> As the uh, agent, the book agent. Right. I was going to say Barry Hay Howith. Hay Hayworth? It was said with an, an, an English accent, so I can't pronounce it. But, well, it, just, it looks like it's spelled. Yeah, I think it's Howarth. Hayworth. I think you have to say Howarth. Howarth. You have to drop the R a little bit. Howarth. How? 
Barry Howarth. Well, ask him. Send send a quick email. We got time uh, to see what he how his name is actually pronounced. Okay, Barry, how do you pronounce your name? Um, hello, Big. This is Barry Howarth. All right. I was hoping you'd say throat warbler mangrove, but thank you, Barry. Um, once again, the we were in a rush, but uh, we had time to wait for you to get back to us on that. How about that? He played the uh, what was the guy's name? Do you remember? He was like the co-worker that the guy on the street found that, uh, that our main character digging in the storm drain for his dropped set of keys. Yes. Then there was Bria Burton, who was. All the female roles, which I think there was only two, there so were only it wasn't like it was a gigantic caffeine. amount, but she was the <laughs> the woman who died tragically in a car accident. Yeah. And uh, the secretary. And then uh, Marshall Latham. Yeah, Marshall Latham played the... For some reason I'm remembering him doing a second voice, but I could be wrong. Uh, but he was definitely the boss at the architectural firm. And then there was Rich Affield, who did all the rest. You did the yeah. narrator plus a few assorted extra characters that had like one line here and there. Yeah, thanks everybody for sending your voice in. However, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that it would be easier to do this the way that I do my audiobooks. And, and so I just recorded the whole thing and did all the voices myself. And then I spliced in the parts as people sent them to me. But there were a couple where I just, uh, you know, it took a while to get the... Okay, I'm still waiting. And so those, I just left Rish Outfield's voice in there. And I, I don't know. It's, I, I don't want to say that this was the episode that broke me. But as I was waiting for lines and people saying, hey, I'm sorry, I'll get those to you, and then they didn't, I started to think, well, do we have to be a full cast podcast? I, what it's not it? our name. We're not the full cast podcast. That's a different show. Brian Lincoln did his first... Uh production with us so i'm gonna take credit for it okay you deserve that <laughs> but sorry uh, let me go back to the story itself this story i think was sent to us after you and i we did a like a one-two punch kind of thing with your story the battle of the, of the ideas, of ideas and my story house of ideas they were both stories about writers getting unusual inspiration toward their writing, you know, almost a magical kind of uh, push. And I think Adam listened to those and was like, well, I've got a story that I think would go well with those. It was like a, a broken mirror that he just decided to add to. Right. And he sent us of. that. And there are definitely parallels. You know, the, the rabbit's foot that puts ideas in his mind or gives him the encouragement to... I, I mean, because the thing is, the rabbit's foot gave him luck, right? But being able to write a, a novel, is that luck? I don't know. I mean, maybe it was just lucky could... that all of his synapses were firing and he was able to focus on what he was doing. Because he, he, he has this unbelievable productivity in two days. Yeah, you know I... what I mean? And I, again, I don't know that that's luck. He's but... like that person that we saw the talk from at that writer's conference that wrote, writes all her books in three days. Right. Um, and I, I, you probably need a, a little bit of luck for something like that to work. You know, it's like my mind was focused. I didn't have a lot of distractions. I, the ideas were coming fast and furious. He wrote everything. Um, he didn't write any typos. He didn't even need to use his red pen when he decided to edit it. He was so lucky. Well, that, see, that's lucky too. But anyhow, you can see how that story reminded me of our stories uh -huh. and uh, is a kind of neat companion piece I, it, you know way way down the line unfortunately but uh, but at the same time it's it's not our stories at all or you know even close to our stories this would have been fine to run on the show independent of us doing those stories right just the whole idea of a lucky rabbit's foot that, that really is lucky it's great. I mean, I, it's the kind of story that that I used to write all the time and the things that still capture my imagination the, yeah. the hardest. It's, the Twilight Zone kind of story. It's a stories. bit of magical realism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't like that term, huh? I know. I just, I, I didn't know that that's what I did. But no, no, magical realism. I still don't quite know what it is, but that's, that's okay. I don't like to admit ignorance 
And so that's <laughs> that's why I went. Hey, 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 so you were also upset when you when when it was pointed out to you that the other thing that you do is furious masturbation. I uh e uh, shoot, <laughs> announcer man. Oh, he's gone. Announcer man, remind me to cut that out later. <laughs> I shouldn't have sent him away. He's just right there in the next room and. Uh, so, what? Are, uh, any thoughts about the story? Uh, this felt a little bit not like your story, but like a story that you would write. Yeah, it definitely felt like uh, one of my stories when the guy, you know, kicks the chair out from under himself at the end of the... Because uh, that happens too many times on my stories. It's It's probably become a crutch. I think it might be interesting to force myself to write a story where that can't happen no matter what i have to come up with a different ending because yeah i just i'm like you know stephen king where he sometimes he just goes for the gross out yeah that's just what i always go for is just that kind of an ending so it fits well with the stuff that we've run of mine on the show before yeah i wrote a story recently called stormy weather and it's out there and it was me trying to write something similar to what stephen king writes you know like the mist or something like that and uh, i realized as i was finishing it that now i think i maybe i'm channeling rather than stephen king i'm channeling big hanklevich <laughs> on this story and so that's that's interesting to uh not, I wasn't purposely trying to write in your style, but it's like, oh, this yeah, is the kind of thing that he... A lot of people confuse me with Stephen King. <laughs> it just happens all the time. It's, it's understandable. I have a problem speaking with a nasal sound every time I talk and say words like blood. <laughs> <laughs> That's messed up, man. <laughs> That's the whole reason I became a writer, but uh, that's all right. We'll just we'll move on. I, what, what did you think of the ending? Um, does it? And how do you respond when people say, "Oh, jeez, your ending, ah, dude"? Yeah, they, I get now that. I'm I mean, I get that from you every time. That's why I quit writing a long time ago. Ah, why bother? That's, that's the reason. Um, okay, I knew you'd find a person to blame. <laughs> but I get that from other people too. Yeah, I, 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 I published a couple of my short stories on Smashwords, and. Uh, one person bought one of them, and uh, that that person was Marshall Latham. And after he read it, he commented and said, "Oh, he said that was a good story, but oh man, you're you are terrible. Like every time, you always do this because, of course, you know the main character died at the end. I don't really think it's like a a thing that I have to do every time." Maybe it's easier to do in short stories. Like, I remember Stephen King talking about Misery. When he first came up with it, it was going to be a short story. And in the end, there was going to be this book that our lead character, the author, wrote. And it was going to be bound in this nice leathery-looking edition. Which, of course, you know, the crazy woman killed him, skinned him, tanned his hide, and used it to bind this book but as he was writing the story which was supposed to be short his character became more resilient than he expected him to and pretty soon he had a novel and now he's like oh crap i can't just kill him at the end because people will be pissed off so he had to change it up and find a way for this guy to to live out his days so, you know, when when it becomes a novel, maybe it's more important. I don't know. It's easier to get away with a downer ending to a short story. It seems like it's definitely much more common with, with short stories. I can remember very few novels that just had downer endings. And, like, the first, I want to say there was a John Grisham book. And I want to say it was called The Cole, not The Client, The... The, some, the Partner, maybe it was called. Anyways, this guy at the end, you know, he has this girl that was supposed to be his, you know, life partner. And she helped him pull off the scam that they did and get a whole bunch of money. And then he was supposed to meet her afterwards. She had the money and he was supposed to meet her and she never showed. It was a downer of an ending. I read that and I was just like, oh man, that... 
sucks for this guy. And I think it may have been the first John Grisham novel that didn't immediately go into production as a movie. Because before everything he did, you know, Time to Kill, Pelican Brief, The Client, The Firm. Fifty you know, Shades of Grey. F yeah, they one after another, every single one of them went up as a movie and then something happened and now you almost never see a John Grisham book as a movie anymore. I don't know why that happened. Maybe John Grisham got tired of dealing with it. Maybe it's his fault. Uh, or maybe people realized, you know what? Not every book works as a movie. Um, I don't know. Uh, that did really go away. Yeah. The whole John Grisham f film phenomenon. I King of the box office, John Grisham. That's so weird, though. That Because, I mean, he still puts out a book a year or a book every six months, right? Something like that, yeah. I don't know what it could have been. I heard The Chamber may have been the book that actually uh, broke the camel's back because they made a movie of that and I want to... No, I'm wrong. I was going to say Matt I, Damon was the... Uh, I think it had Gene Hackman and Chris O'Donnell in it is what I want to okay, say. Okay, yeah, Chris O'Donnell I don't know. was the young lawyer. Matt Damon was in the, the Rainmaker, which came out after The Chamber, but I think it was already in production before The Chamber failed to deliver. Because mm. The Chamber was, I guess, also a... I hadn't read it at the time, but it was a, a downer one at the end, too. He's trying to save somebody from the gas chamber that was on death row, and he doesn't. And <laughs> Spoilers! Sorry! Spoiler alert! Um, mm -hmm. I just gave away the ending probably to a couple of things. A couple of books slash movies there, but... Yeah, well, does he make the rain in Rainmaker? Does does it rain at the oh, end Oh, it rains. Yeah. Okay, okay. He good. makes it rain. In uh, okay. the, the Rainmaker, and in A Time to Kill, is it, is it time? There was a time to kill. Okay, and, and a time to die. Okay. No, that's good. And and in, is the Pelican <laughs> brief? No, it's actually pretty long. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. And was it firm? Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna stop. After the next one, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the downer ending, I, it, big business in Japan, I've heard. But, uh, you know, the tragic ending, not such big business in the Western world. I've heard that happy endings are really popular in Thailand. <laughs> oh, oh, Adam's story. Uh, yes, has end. a downer ending. His luck shoots up and then drops very quickly. Yeah, that's that, that's rough. Yeah, it's it's a sad story. You feel bad for this guy. Yeah, I mean it was all it was meteoric in its rise and meteoric in its fall, which was uh, interesting. It, it, <laughs> you could say it was funny if it weren't for the fact that it was people dying of car accidents and being fired and having their book deals go south. But <laughs> This story isn't the one that broke the camel's back. Or maybe it's the one that broke the camel's back, but it's just one of many straws that got it there, as far as the full cast thing goes. Well, let's hear your point of view on that, sir. Because you've been producing an episode for a while now, and uh, hopefully it will come out soon. But uh, that seems like a camel being broken as well. Uh, some stories are just not easy for you and i we can sit down and we can read a story together and as long as there's a bunch of male characters we can do several like you did th for today's story you did at least three the narrator plus at least two more and for example when we did david farland's story what was it called ship uh, of fools ship of fools when we did ship of fools we sat down and we read that and you and i just kind of went back and forth on all the various characters sang songs it was it was pretty easy to do. There was you know we got some people that filled in the other roles, but the majority of the characters were male characters, so we could just use what we did if we had to, if nobody volunteered or nobody got us our audio. I'm producing a story with Jonathan Wilson that has a lot of a lot of female characters, almost no male characters, and it's my own damn fault because I wrote the story, but uh, it's not an easy one for us. We have a few. Uh, character or, or we have a few people who can give us you know female voices 
but at a certain point we run out of people to ask. So right now I'm still stuck with one voice not voiced yet. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out I'll have that taken care of. But uh, yeah, I mean it's been languishing for a, a long time because of that fact. And I, th I find that to be the hardest part. Maybe you d disagree with me. But lining up a different person for casting the story, getting the emails out, get showing everybody, oh, these are your lines and these are your lines, these are your lines, getting them all to get those back is the most time-consuming part of all of it. And so I don't know that it's a straw that broke the camel's back. I think I probably, and I, I think we still should do full cast stories every now and then when it's not too hard to do. But our output has gotten so low because of that. Uh, you know, basically the time available to us in our lives to dedicate to that kind of stuff has gone down enough that, yeah, we, we just can't manage it. And I know that at least half of our listeners, probably more, listen to other shows that just do straight reads. They have one reader. They don't even have, like, somebody else bouncing it back and forth. Um, we've taken a lot of pride over the years in, in our, uh, you know, more fancy productions than most people do. But I think there comes a time when you just got to do what's best for the show and maybe swallow your pride, I guess. And I don't think that the quality of the readings will be any less. Cause I think you and I do a good job together. So we don't have to worry too much about that. But, um, yeah, it's just less often we're going to see a full cast. We did take a poll, a, a, a uh, informal poll of people on Facebook, what they thought of that. And I think, was it the one that had just tons and tons and tons of responses? Yeah, there was a lot of people that decided to weigh in on that. And it seemed like most everybody was willing to say, you know what, I don't, as long as we get stuff, I don't really care. If it makes, uh, you know, you guys able to do more stories, then we, yeah, we're down with it. And there were a few people who said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't have to absolutely eliminate it. Just do them, you know, as special events or something, which... And see, I had it. already tossed the baby, and I live on the <laughs> third floor, guys, yep. at that point. So, you know, it's kind of like, ooh, what's done is done. I <laughs> guess I could go down there, but it's not crying. Sorry, that was, I channeled Big Anklevich there on that one. The, but, the, yeah, the thing is, if it was, if we were just doing straight reads, uh, you know, what Farfetched Fables or Escape Pod or, you know, all those guys do, I could record a bunch of stories and have you record a bunch of stories and we would come out so much more regularly and eventually we would run out of stories. You know what I'm saying? We would have to start looking for stories again instead of just, yeah, Josh, I we've got to. your story, but we, you know, it's not going to be this year. Sorry, Josh. It's Josh. It's 32,000 words, <laughs> you know? And so there's yeah, that sort of thing. I would have to, uh, put your uh, insults behind me and start writing again. Yeah, and we can't have that. <laughs> we sure can't. Guys, that would be oh, that would be <laughs> awful. I, that would be why we started the Doonstief in the first place. <laughs> uh so yeah, I I'm sorry where I'm I am announcing the retirement of the full cast format on this show and uh you know, if people have a bad, a hard time with it then think of the alternative, which is what you've had for the last few months. <laughs> But, like Big said, people really like that. They seem enamored of it, that we would go to that much unnecessary trouble. So we could probably still do Skype episodes. We did one, and I, I wanted to do several, where people just all call in at the same time, and we record their, or they record their audio, and then send it in. We've recorded the whole story from beginning to end. We've got all the parts covered. And like you said, that's... The difficulty is getting all those parts covered and highlighting the lines and sending it. And then it's just like, oh, shoot, I missed a line. Now I have to send them another email <laughs> and hope that they can get to that line. And But I can't finish the episode until they get back to me. I, it's just 
And I know I'm whining, but it's but why? Why do we have to do all this stuff? We don't have to do all this stuff. If I read the story from beginning to end and then I sent it to you and said, okay, you know, do all the husband's lines and splice them in there, no one would complain. It's still a new episode, well narrated, produced, and then we would talk about it the same as any episode at the end. And so, yeah, the alternative is not to have the show. So there we go. Have I talked too much? No, I don't think so. I don't like that alternative. So we're going to change things up. And we're going to do it that way. And so there'll still be shows. There's always that gets my goat, too. Lots of good stuff over there. We may still record one of those today if uh, if we can finish this one up in time. I feel bad for your food, though, being in the bottom of the garbage pan. And let me say this, though. I mean, I, I've thrown out the baby. It's gone, guys. Funeral will be held on Tuesday. Send uh, donations in lieu of flowers. But... <laughs> If there's somebody out there that's just like, oh, oh, my great wish was to narrate on the Dune Steve, you can still do that. Just send me an email to editor at dunesteef.com and say, I want to do a story. We will send you a story. You get to narrate the whole f-ing thing. <laughs> and then once you've sent it to me, Big and I will put our voices in there. But it's just, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not, I'm not going to do it anymore the, the other way. Is that unreasonable? No, your, uh, your vehemence just makes me chuckle. <laughs> listen, there are stories we've not done on the show and we can't do on the show because of they they re- rely on women narrators or teen girl narrators or teen girls of color narrators where it's just like, how are we going to do this, dude? And the amount of hair we've lost trying to figure <laughs> out how to do that could have been saved if we'd just be like, okay, you know, Marshall Latham is going to be performing this entire story, which was is the, the Harriet Tubman autobiography. <laughs> Perfect. The the controversy would have her casting could it would be. have dissolved by now. It would have gone away and been forgotten by now. In the time that it took us to try and find somebody to narrate that piece. Yeah, that's true. So uh, th- th- there's that. Uh, yeah, if you are female and you would like to do that, I-, I have stuff right now that's coming to mind that it's just like that. I've always wanted to have Renee. Chambliss narrate for me and never had the courage to ask her to do. Uh, let us know. I, Bria did a great job. I had her do both female characters because I just... Uh, there's not enough hours <laughs> left in the world, guys. Uh, do you know what I'm saying? I, I We had Tina do voices on, on or the last ep- uh, episode that I produced. I had Tina do the voices and it was just great. But I'm not comfortable. I'm not confident with asking people, hey, will you do the whole thing? Because... I did that. I made Tina do the whole thing of my uh, story that I'm producing. When okay. it comes out, she's the narrator. And see, we shouldn't have a problem doing that because I get requests all the time from other podcasts that say, here's a story and it's not short and I need it by Friday and I need you to edit it. <laughs> okay. And I do that. But for some crazy reason, I'm uncomfortable asking Renee or Tina or Bria to do that for us. Maybe it's because I'm just, I have too much empathy and I know what that's like, or it's just like, oh, geez, it's 2.15 a.m. and I still haven't done this thing. I guess I won't be going to sleep. So I just, I wanted to put that out there. Hopefully you understand my motivations now in this. But again, silver lining is if you want to do it, if you are still young (laughs) and full of vinegar and the other thing. Sauce. Sauce. There you go. Then just let us know and I've got something for you right now. I'm writing a story right now that uh, maybe you could do as well when when I finish that story. And I am not. And Big is not. But if you guys start (laughs) volunteering, I will have to. Yeah, that would be good. Guys, I appreciate you listening to the Dune Steve all these years. We are going on eight years of existence, I believe, or or maybe this is nine. We started in 2008. On July 1st, it will be eight full years of Dune Steve. We've got another episode coming down the pipe and... uh, as long as you are okay with the, a, 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 a slightly adjusted format, I think I can guarantee more episodes. But uh, as always, you can talk about what you thought of the show in the forums. You can go out and buy my book. Uh, you can leave comments right here on the page. You can leave reviews over the iTunes for the Dune Steef. You can send us donations. These are all things that you are free to do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of freedoms that you yeah. take for granted every single day. 
I feel like I should sing I'm proud to be an American. That's or so something. effed up. I was going to do the same thing. It's weird. You and I are on the same wavelength all of a sudden, mostly because we're we're baking together in this car. Yeah, I feel like I need to stick my head out the window. It's no longer winter. No. And recording in the car becomes less viable when that happens. We weren't scheduled to record today, but we sort of made an exception. Big skipped eating so that we could bring you this episode. Because I think there's still some affection there. We still like you guys for listening to the show, for being fans of the show. And hey, you've donated to the show, and I appreciate that. And that could be a problem because I'm a diabetic now, so skipping eating sometimes means death. Oh, my lord. I See, that's dedication, guys. He may not write or love his children, but wow, that you know, there, there you go. That's, he's, he's making the, the ultimate sacrifice, really, for you guys. Yep. Uh, the Jersey th- might not actually go on as long as we hoped, if that does turn out to be the case. But, you know, whatever. This episode's important. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, well, there's one more episode out there that we can guarantee. And it's yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Big and there's me talking two. about the end of the show. And, there's the uh, final uh, episode dead. and the David Bowie episode. So mm-hmm. we actually recorded that one ahead of time. So, you know, I, uh, this show's going on. If you died, the <laughs> David Bowie episode would not ever see the light of day. Oh, so. uh, Yeah. Oh, well, I guess I could email Jonathan Wilson yeah. and say, Hey, man, you, uh, what do you got? You it's like, still it waiting on, just send it. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's it. Anything more? I don't think so. Is there anything more you wanted to say about the story? I, I'd like to. We just don't have any time, guys. Um, I'm sorry, there's no time. Uh, can, can I just say that this is the first time I've uh, announced there won't be any more full cast stories? <laughs> I'm sorry, there isn't time. Anyhow, thank you, guys. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I wish I could say that there's going to be contests and stuff. Who knows? If 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 this new format change makes the show easier, then yeah, yeah then then we, you can expect some cool stuff in the future. Uh, as of now, no no cool stuff at all. No, I <laughs> have declared a moratorium on coolness as well, and I would know. Yeah, he knows all about lack of coolness. Yes. Okay, announcer man, come on back. Okay. <laughs> and lead us in the, uh, the, the the Creative Commons speech. I've been Rich Outfield. And I've been Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening, everybody. And thanks, Adam, for your story. Thanks, Rich, for producing it. Thanks. Sorry I broke your back. Was that Adam talking? <laughs> All right, guys. Good night. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Oh, it wasn't recording. What the f- Take two. Okay, hold on a sec. It's stuffy in it. It's awful. We'll try just one one window. What do you think of that? Oh, okay. We're gonna see if that works. That way we won't get a cross breeze and maybe the we won't get wind on the mic. Okay. We'll see if that helps. If it doesn't, we can open the other window too. If you're just still sweating and feeling like crap over there, then. Uh. <clears throat> okay. Sorry, you were going somewhere. Well, let's hear your point of view on that, sir. Because you've been producing a story. Gosh, that's loud. Is it? Can they hear that? Yeah, the plane is loud. I don't know what's going on with that. I bet they can hear it. The rest of the traffic, I don't think, is too bad. But that stupid plane. See, I always have to record my audiobooks at night. Because when I make the mistake of recording them during the day, you can hear all the planes going to the airport, which is, you know, three miles away. And... And you can hear me cursing at the airplanes. <laughs> and yeah, I I would include me hoping that the plane goes down and crashes and everyone dies over and over and over again in my like outtakes. Except for I think that would get old real fast. <laughs> Doesn't get old for me. I'm just a boundless volcano of hate. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a, it's an ugly sound. Yes?
Do you want to do a podcast? Do you want to do a show? That better not be you, Big. Do you want to do a podcast? It could open many doors. And by the time it ends, we'll make loads of friends. Not to mention all the whores. F*** off! Okay, bye.